Hello dear friends, welcome. We are approaching one of the most important times in the liturgical year, the season of Lent. A time to reflect on the meaning of our faith, on the passion, death and resurrection of Jesus, central to our Christian faith. Many of us spend our Lent in fasting, abstaining from meat, refraining from watching TV, so on and so forth. These external actions, while required to enter the Paschal Treedom in the right disposition, is, however, not enough. The Church rightly reminds us in the first reading, which is read at Mass every Ash Wednesday, taken from the prophet Joel. Now, now, it is the Lord who speaks. Come back to me with all your heart, fasting, weeping, mourning. Let your hearts be broken, not your garments torn. Turn to the Lord your God again. Holy Mother the Church reminds us, her children, that any preparation for the Paschal Treedom has to result in a change of heart, a metanoia, a U-turn as it were. Otherwise, as St. Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, if there is no change in heart, no love of God within us, we would be like a gong booming. All our external actions of fasting, abstinence, etc. would be like noise to the ears of God, thus blocking ourselves from the graces God wants to give us this season of Lent. Yes, dear friends, the season of Lent and Easter is a time when God bestows superabundant graces on those who revere him with sincere hearts. Lent is a time to realize our sins. What does it do regarding our relationship with God? And cry out to God with repentant hearts, knowing full well that if we approach the throne of grace, God will not abandon us, as the letter to the Hebrews reminds us. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. To help us in our preparation of Lent, we will reflect on the parable of the prodigal son presented in the Gospel according to St. Luke chapter 15 verses 11 to 32. The parable of the prodigal son is a paragon of parables par excellence. As Pope St. John Paul II so beautifully puts it, the parable of the prodigal son expresses in a simple but profound way the reality of conversion. And conversion, my dear friends, is at the heart of Lent. Lent is meant to transform us, renew us, thereby enabling us to be open to the new life that Jesus offers us through the Easter season. Through our reflection on this parable, we shall see the following. What is sin all about? The work of grace, the true nature of God. Our reflection will culminate in what our response ought to be to the overtures God makes towards us sinful creatures. So come, let's immerse ourselves in this parable. Luke devotes an entire chapter to counter the complaint of the scribes and Pharisees that Jesus ate and drank with tax collectors and sinners. He uses the imagery of the lost sheep, the lost coin and the lost son to drive home the message that Jesus has come to seek the lost and save those consigned to live in darkness. This entire ch chapter is a wonderful reflection on the mercy and love of God. A love which to us humans seems totally irrational, illogical, against our way of living. We now begin our journey to the parable of the prodigal son. Jesus said, a man had two sons. At the very outset itself, Jesus wishes to remind his hearers, and us as well, that human life is all about relationships. We are not to live individualistic lives which is sadly the norm of today's world. 
Our lives are to be communitarian, where all of us, irrespective of our beliefs, are brothers and sisters with God as our Father. Recall the first creation story in the book of Genesis. After God finished creating the world, which was inclusive of our first parents, our first family, God saw all that he had made and indeed it was very good. Humanity was to be the crown of God's creation. But then sin entered and ruined this wonderful relationship between God and us. And what did sin do and continues to do even today? Let us see. Jesus then proceeds to describe what has happened to this family originally destined to live together. By stating that he wishes to have his share of the estate, the younger son is in fact telling his father, Father, I wish you were dead. He is claiming his right to the father's inheritance in advance. This is the first effect of sin. Sin divides us from God. That is, sin breaks our relationship with God our Father. Jesus then goes on to describe the life of this young boy. It is a life of sin. The young boy goes to a distant country. Note the word distant. This is the second effect of sin. Sin takes us very, very far away from God. Now, not only did sin take the young boy away from his father, it caused him to squander his money on a life of debauchery. Jesus uses the word money as a symbol of the gifts God gives us. In other words, the Father has given us numerous gifts, but sin causes us to abuse those very God-given gifts, to squander them, just waste away them as it were. And what do we waste our gifts on? On a life of drunkenness and loose living. Mind you, loose living is not only to do with adulterous living, but is much more. Our gifts are used loosely when we are in sin. Thus, our tongue will gossip about the next door neighbor. We use our minds deviously to bring down the fall of our fellow brother or sister, who may, we may dislike for whatever reason. The list can just go on. I invite you, dear friends, to see ourselves in this unfortunate young boy. He was called to live in the father's house, but chose to live out in a world that only destroyed him. Sin destroys us. It destroys our self-worth, our gifts, our talents, indeed our very being. To sum it up, sin kills our soul. In other words, sin kills that part of us that is in connect with the living God and drags us down into the mire of filth and stench. To give a comparison for those of us living in the urban village, the young boy chose to come out of his plush, seven-roomed, state-of-the-art apartment and he chose to live in the gutters of the most dirtiest of all neighborhoods. At this point, let us ponder on the purpose of our creation and the state of our present existence. On this mountain, Yahweh Sabbath will prepare for all peoples a banquet of rich food, a banquet of fine wines, of food rich and juicy, of fine strained wines. Dear friends, we were truly created for exquisite things as the prophet Isaiah states. Yahweh has prepared for us a banquet of rich food, a banquet of fine wines, of food rich and juicy of fine strained wines. However, as St. John of the Cross sharply points out, O oh my soul, created to enjoy such exquisite gifts, what are you doing? Where is your life going? How wretched is the blindness of Adam's children, if indeed we are blind to so bright a light and deaf to so insistent a voice. We are being created to enjoy such exquisite gifts, dear friends, but what are we doing about our lives? about the gifts God gives us. 
Our wretchedness is attributed to us being blind to the brilliant light and the insistent voice of so loving a Father. God is constantly talking to us, revealing Himself to us, be it in our daily experiences, in those around us, in His Word, that is the Bible, at Mass, etc. The question is, do we respond positively towards Him? Or do we continue to live out our lives away from the Father who is all love? The younger boy was called to live in the Father's house, but yet chose to go away. We too could be doing the same thing. Are our eyes and ears open to what God has to offer? Or are we caught up in the cares and riches of the world, which only takes us away from the Father? When he had spent it all, that country experienced a severe famine, and now he began to feel the pinch. Jesus then goes on to describe further consequences of sin. The country experienced a severe famine, but unfortunately for this young man, all that the father had given him was over. He was reduced to extreme poverty. Sin, while on the outside looks very flashy and glamorous, inwardly not only destroys the soul, but reduces its victim to abject poverty. That is, sin reduces us to a life of loneliness and pain. In our efforts to counter this loneliness and pain, we may turn to alcohol, drugs, sex, gossip mongering, or any other vice just to satisfy our temporal state of being. What does the younger son now do? He does the unthinkable. He goes and hires himself on some farm to feed the pigs. Do bear in mind that Jesus is speaking to a Jewish audience. For a Jew, the pig was an unclean animal. To associate with pigs would render one ritually unclean, unable to take part in the temple worship so central to the life of the Jewish community. It would render one an outcast from the Jewish community. This is what sin did. Not only did sin separate the young boy from his father and kept him distant from the father, it caused the young boy to become an outcast to his own Jewish brethren. This is what sin does to you and me. Sin causes us to be cut off from the life of the church. So when we are in a state of sin, we risk not only losing the gifts and fruits of the Spirit, but also the life of the Spirit offered in and through Holy Mother the Church. And the situation only worsens. For Jesus tells us that the younger son not only got himself to work on the farm to feed the pigs, but even worse, the hunger this young boy faced was so intense, he was willing to eat the husks the pigs were eating, but no one offered him anything. The younger son now truly reached the nadir of his life. He totally hit rock bottom. He reached the end of the pit. The only option left was to bury himself in the ground. But God has a strange ways of bringing even the most hardened of sinners back to him. And this is what the wonderful season of Lent is all about. Then he came to senses and said, How many of my father's paid servants have more food than they want, and here am I dying of hunger. The parable takes a surprising turn. The younger son miraculously starts to ponder on his current situation and decides that the best way out is to go back to his father as a paid servant. The son now realizes that even the paid servants are better off in the father's house than he is here. To what could we owe the sudden change of events? In describing the journey of the soul to God, St. John of the Cross states that the movement of the soul towards God is sheer grace. In other words, only God and God alone can bring about the change that is required in us in order to become closer to Him. As a hymn so beautifully goes, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. 
Truly, it is only by grace that we can go back to the living God. While this may leave us a bit bewildered as to what one can do to win this grace of God, the fact of the matter is, grace is God's help freely given to us unconditionally. No action of ours could ever merit this grace. It is a free gift as St. Paul says in his letter to the Ephesians. Because it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, not by anything of your own, but by a gift from God. Not by anything that you have done, so that nobody can claim the credit. At this point, we can only thank God that grace was at work in the young man. And as Jesus in the Gospel according to Mark told the man who was delivered from the evil spirits, Go home to your people and tell them all that the Lord in his mercy has done for you. Yes, my dear friends, it is only through the mercy of God that his grace flows out to us. We need, however, to pray daily for this divine grace to be affected more deeply in our lives. The prodigal son now decides to go back. Note that he has carefully rehearsed in his mind what he will tell his father. The young man does not wish to be called his son, but even a paid servant would do. What a contrast to his attitude at the beginning of the parable, where he unjustly and proudly demanded his share of the inheritance, abandoning his loving father. What a turn of events! We must, however, at this stage commend the younger son for picking up the courage to go back to the father. What a wonderful thing is this grace which comes from the most loving father. Will the father accept the younger son just as he is? Will he put some conditions for his return? Will the father take him back as a paid servant? We shall see the father's response in the next part of the series. God bless. Ave Maria.